Hello everyone. Hello, everyone. Thank you for Thank joining, you for joining us, virtually. us virtually. I would like, I would to, like introduce to introduce to you Rick Lascombe. Rick, Lascombe. Rick was Rick recently was retired, retired as a vascular, as a vascular access, access, access clinic nurse, nurse at Providence Healthcare, where he was, where responsible, he was responsible for ensuring, for ensuring optimal, optimal dialysis, dialysis outcomes, outcomes in real patients. Real patients. Rick has worked for 35, 35 years in nephrology, with 28, with 28 of those years working in hemodialysis. hemodialysis. He obtained his he RN, RN from, from George Brown George College, College in 85, and, and his, bachelor his Bachelor of Science, Science in, nursing in Nursing in 2002. In 2002. Uh, in 2013, in 2013 he, was he was awarded the, the Excellence, Excellence in Nursing, nursing Education, Education Award from the Canadian Registered Nurses, nurses of British Columbia, and in 2014, 2014 he was a recipient, was a recipient of the Kant, the Kant Award, Award for Excellence in Leadership and Administration. In 2015, Rick was the recipient of the Wilma Crockett Award. He is a role model for the nursing profession and his desire for knowledge, education, and research is exemplary. Rick will be available after the presentation. Just use your event app on your smartphone for Q&A. I'm honored, I'm honored to introduce, to introduce to you, you, Rick Lescombe. Okay, I would like to thank Deidre for um, inviting me to speak today on, on, on this topic, cannulation, tips and lessons that I've learned over the past 35 years. Um, I would like to disclose that I do consult for um, BD Bard and um, also consult with Diaxamed. So this is what we would really wanna to try to avoid, having someone um, look in terror as they watch someone candulate. So hopefully some of these tips will help you so that you're more successful in your candulation. Some of the objectives I'm gonna to cover today, um, I'm gonna to review access health and pre-cannulation assessment. I would like to discuss the usage of Teflon and steel needles and share tips and lessons learned on cannulation that have served me well. Patient education on the process. So what do I mean by process? So process for cannulation doesn't start with just the act of cannulation. It also starts with your pre-assessment all the way through to hemostasis. It actually helps form a collaborative relationship between you and the, the patient and, and it um, and fosters patient empowerment. And how is this done? By explaining what you are doing, but more importantly, why you're doing it. And if, it's also a good way if you need to pass on information to um, another nurse, a patient's the best way to do it. Assessment to determine access health. So we all know about the three components, visualization, palpation, and auscultation. And I'm going to basically um, just tell you tips. I'm not going to go through each one individually because that could be a whole presentation by itself. So visualization. One of the lessons I learned, I was never taught, is to do an arm raise. Um, so what you do is you raise the arm above the patient's heart, and a normal fistula should actually drain and collapse. If you have a stenotic area, it will bulge proximal to the stenosis. In palpation, another um, thing that I learned over time uh, that I was not taught is an augmentation test. An augmentation test actually evaluates the strength of the arterial inflow. What you do is compress the outflow vein about two centimeters or so from the anastomosis, and your thrill should disappear and the vein should become very pulsatile. And that um, directly responds to the strength of the arterial inflow. It's also a good way to determine if there's other accessory vessels that are draining um, the major flow from that, from that vein. And what happens is that when you compress, the thrill doesn't actually disappear, it still stays there. And so that you know you have other um, vessels competing for the flow. With auscultation, um, the lessons, there's a couple of lessons learned. A, when you're placing your stethoscope, just gently place it over the fistula. Um, uh, if you compress too much, you're actually going to cause a stenosis or what, what's going to mimic a stenosis. And the other lesson I learned is that 35% of stenosis occur at the chest. And most nurses don't auscul auscultate all the way to the chest wall. And you should be doing so. So pre-cannulation. So this is where you're doing your assessment uh, to see where you're going to place your needles. And uh, a vascular access nurse that I worked with many, many years ago, Deb Eggers, always said that slow is fast. So take your time. Don't take any shortcuts. This will save you, the extra minutes that you save can save you hours of trying to solve a problem after the cannulation process. So another tip that I have is plan in advance. If you don't think, uh, you know, 
I always plan for three needles. I'm determining alternate sites. If one needle is not successful, where else can I go? And lessons learned, if you have the tools, use them. So that's like, use your stethoscope. If you have an ultrasound, use an ultrasound. And if you have Dopplers, use a Doppler. The next process is like choosing the right device. The Cardex may say like a 16 gauge needle, but you know, when you're doing your assessment, where are you placing the needle? Um, how deep is the, um, the fistula? Do you need a longer needle? Uh, do you need um, a Teflon needle opposed to a steel needle because you're gonna go in a point of flexion? Is the patient really restless today? Maybe you wanna use Teflons instead of steels. So choose uh, the right device for that particular day and time. So just a little bit about Teflons and steels. Similarities, they're both used to access the blood. Um, there's various gauges and sizes. They're generally used for short-term use. You pull them out afterwards and you have to attach tubing to them afterwards to, um, to proceed with dialysis. The big difference is Teflons generally don't have wings. Uh, there's different holding techniques for both Teflons and steels. Teflons generally don't have clamps. Teflons, there's extra steps you have to insert uh, partially, then you have to pull the steel away from the Teflon material and advance the Teflon. With uh, Teflons, once you're um, in position, if you pull out the steel, you can't reposition the needle. So if you have a problem, you're going to have to pull it out. And when do you use them? Historically, Teflons have been used for rest restless patients and torturous fistulas. And the cost is the big um the big thing with, with Teflons they are a little bit more expensive than the steel needles. Hence why we probably haven't used a lot of them in the past. So one site does not fit all. So, you know, you see the, um, at the bottom of the screen, you can see the picture of the very aneurysmic fistula. Um, the problem with going in the same sites is that it causes this. But the reason people do cannulate in the same sites because it's easier to cannulate, they're afraid to go to new sites. They don't have the confidence or experience. The patients say it's less painful and the patients also instruct you to do so. To avoid having these big aneurysms, what you should be doing, you should have a plan. With every dialysis, you should be moving the needle sites one milliliter, milliliter, millimeter from the previous site. And that way you're gonna do a true rope ladder technique. Patient education, really start early. Start when the fistula is first created. Um, with rope ladder, I said, do the um, one millimeter at a time, you know, and actually have the patient take charge when educated, um, take charge. If, this, if they're educated correctly, they can do so. The process of cannulation, determining where. So you're gonna use palpation again, and this is going to determine um, the depth, the diameter, the length, and the, mo mo uh, the mobility of the vessel. And you're going to look at the entire excess to determine cannulation sites, not just where everyone else has gone before. So how do I do this? I use a two-finger technique, technique. I use my index finger and my middle finger. It's about the size of a, a one-inch needle. And I place my fingers over top of the vessel and gently roll back and forth. I've seen a lot of people poking with one finger. Poking really isn't sufficient. It doesn't really tell you what you um, much about the vessel besides it's there. In preparation, I suggest you clean one site at a time. It pre prevents contamination at the next site. I've seen many people just wipe both sites at the same time. So can, um, clean the arterial, then cannulate, clean the venous, then cannulate. Another suggestion that I have, um, if you're cleaning with normal sealing because patients are allergic to everything under the sun, I really do su suggest that this should be a sterile technique. We are now all wearing masks because of COVID, um, but I think if, if you're using normal saline, you should really be using sterile gloves as well and consider it a sterile technique. Just wanna talk a little bit about vasospasm and this can happen for a number of reasons, um, mainly from freezing especially with new fistulas and for missed needles. And so a tip with vasospasm, if you find it's an ongoing issue, try cannulating the venous first and then try the arterial. Lessons learned with missed needles, wait. If you have a miss, missed needle, go do something else, come back, let the vessel relax, and then, and then proceed with needling. This will eliminate doing four or five needles. And this is just an image of um, basal spasm and mimic stenosis. It looks very much the same. 
another thing I hear, should we go bevel up or bevel down? There's uh, a lot of literature to support both. It's kind of controversial. Um, my preference and how I was taught to do bevel down. So because I've been doing this, I went and looked for a paper, at least I would support what I'm doing. And Dr. Tazi in 2017, um, in then endovascular today, um, said that the posterior wall um, is vulnerable to um, stenosis and pseudoaneurysm formation. And then when the bevel is up, it's possible to damage um, the wall with sharp needles. With the bevel down, it is impossible to create this damage. Well, I wouldn't say impossible because damage can be done no matter what, but he did a little trial and did a year of doing bevel down. And he showed in his unit that the rate of hematoma and pseudoaneurysm formation decreased. So I just had um, a bit of a schematic here showing um, his, uh, his drawing showing bevel down and bevel up. And you can see with the bevel up, it's actually pier piercing the um, posterior wall. And so by the time you level out, you've already infiltrated. Try to move all the patients as much as possible. Um, and also listen to your patient. If they're complaining of pain, you're hitting the wall somewhere. And if they're complaining of burning, you've actually infiltrated and fluid is leaking into the tissue. Cannulation. Um, this was suggested by radiology, and this is a lesson that I learned. Why are we inserting the needles all the way in? Um, there's more at risk infiltrating from the, post um, the posterior wall. So basically what you should be doing is inserting to see a flash, advance a little bit further, maybe a quarter to, the, um, a quarter to halfway, and then actually taping it down so you're not at risk of um, infiltrating the posterior wall. Another tip, uh, if you're cannulating and then flipping your bevel, um, which is not recommended, but I have seen nurses do that. Why not go in that way in the first place? Another um, controversy that people have, and this is from Dr. Tazi as well, should the arterial needle be anti-grade or retrograde? He's saying that if you actually do a retrograde needle, you actually create a flap and it's prevent hemostasis from um, forming post-dialysis because of the blood flow hitting the valve um, or the flap. And that um, I also think that because um, the valve or the flap is um, against the flow, you cause turbulence and that could possibly cause stenosis in the future. Anchoring. So there's um, two different techniques that are in the um, literature that um, tells you how to cannulate fistulas. Uh, one's a C technique and the other is a three point. Um, and I'm gonna show you um, both techniques. Um, what I have learned, I have a two finger approach. Again, I'm using my middle finger and, to compress and my index finger to locate. So this is the, um, the C technique where you pull back and you pull forward. And these are great for fissures are quite large, but if you can't see it and you can't feel it, I don't think this is the greatest method. This is the three point technique. Again, sandwiching the fistula between your fingers. And this is another variation on the theme. Again, if um, the fistula is deep, I don't know if you can feel it. With this technique that I use, um, I'm compressing with my middle finger, my index finger is my locator. So if the vessel moves, um, I know where to redirect my, um, my needle. So lessons learned. Uh, another thing with, with cannulating, if you're cannulating a low flow axis or a person that's bradycardic, wait till the next anticipated pulse. And that way you'll see a flashback. A lot of times you'll cannulate and you won't see a flashback. You've gone through the vessel and then you see the flash and it's too late. Another cannulation tip for me is I turn my wings to the side. So I have visualization of my flashback at all times. I don't have to adjust the needle or um, look under my hands to see if I have a flashback or not. Checking for patency. Again, is I have my two finger technique. Um, I place my fingers where I think the needle point is, and then I instill the blood or saline. And if you feel a bubble, then you know you've infiltrated. I also suggest that you should be um, checking patency um, with each needle insertion and not just inserting needles and hooking up. And that's where you run into a lot of problems. Also lessons learned, um, the use of tourniquets. 
Um, I think they're of great benefit. They help dilate the vessel, they anchor the vessel. They're, they have cleaner, sharper needle insertion when using a tourniquet and it decreases pain. Ultrasound is a big thing that has um, come to usage in many dialysis units within about the last, oh, I would say um, five to 10 years. Um, one of the lessons I've learned is that all new accesses, if you have an ultrasound, you should look um, to see what that look, uh, that fistula looks like and what the lay of the land looks like. And if you look at um, the image on the right, you can see that this person um, where the white glowy um, circle is in the, in the black hole, that's the needle. But right below it, you can see he has three more arteries. So if you cannulate through that, you're at risk of creating the pseudoaneurysms. So here's another um, uh, demonstration of a fistula with a great big pseudoaneurysm on the side. The, the gray matter at the bottom is all thrombus, so it's not growing, but this was from um, improper needle insertion going through the, uh, the sidewall. And here again, you're seeing that if you have an ultrasound, you can see the fistula on top with uh, the mixed colors and below you can see the blood flowing into the pseudoaneurysm through the posterior wall. Um, this is, if you have any, if you think you have um, had a mis um, cannulation and you've infiltrated at all, if you have an ultrasound, you should actually look to make sure that you don't have that uh, blood flowing into the, um, into the uh, pseudoaneurysm. Um, sorry, um, with ultrasound again, we're trying to prevent the back blows and just a little story that I have and hopefully it won't take too long. Um, why I think it's really important, we had a young boy uh, that had a new fistula and got through dialysis fine, but at the end of dialysis, he just wasn't recovering quite right. And um, he was kept for a very long time in the unit. Um, we wanted to keep him overnight, but he refused. He went home. Um, he seemed to be stable, and then the next morning he passed away. Um, and we're not quite sure, but um, because I've, I've never heard the, what the coroner said, but I really do think that he had a back blow, and um, we should have looked on ultrasound when that was a lesson learned, that we should have looked on ultrasound to make sure that he actually was stable before he, he went home. When using... Um, Ultrasound again, another lesson that i um, learned. Tourniquets and compressing the, um, uh, the vessels will sometimes artificially raise the fistula closer to the surface. And then after you cannulate and release the tourniquet or the compression, the fistula will drop and the needle will stay in place and then you have an infiltration. So it's uh, more important that when you're cannulating with um, ultrasound and using compression or tourniquet to ensure that that needle is all, in this case, all the way into the vessel if they're deep so that you know it's not gonna pop out when you, um, when you release the tourniquet. Many nurses have problems with eye-hand coordination, especially if they've been, um, if they're older and you know, not to be ageist, but but I've seen it happen. They seem to watch their hands because this is what they're, they're used to when cannulating and they don't watch the screen. So one of my suggestions is, you know what? If you have children, they're playing video games, video games play with them because this will help with their eye-hand eye coordination and um, get you to trust looking at a screen. <clears throat> Other lessons I've learned, vessels move all the time and that's why I put in the stabilization, um, how to stabilize, don't jab. You, um, when you're inserting a needle, um, take your time because uh, you're more likely to um, have a posterior infiltration if you jab. With rope ladder again, have a plan so that everyone's on board to um, avoid the one-sideitis and the, the big pseudoaneurysms and aneurysms and involve the patients. They are the only consistent member of the team. When securing um, after needle emplacement, one of the tips I have is if you're using tegaderms, place a bit of tape um, posterior um, uh, to the distal portion of the tegaderm. And then when you place your next needle, the tegaderm will lie across um, the tape. So when you're removing the needle, the tegaderm at the end of dialysis, they won't stick together. And hemostasis, just a few uh, point, points that um, 
proper needle removal removal is a, is as important as proper um, cannulation. Uh, applying pressure when pulling up the needle. If the patient complains, if it's it's painful, then you're applying too much pressure, and hemostasis will take longer because you're recutting the patient. You should be holding for 10 to 15 minutes without taking shortcuts. Um, because lessons I've learned, the puncture site into the vessel may still be bleeding. Um, and we've seen this with ultrasound. You can see hematomas that aren't visible on the skin, but are invisible, that are visible when you use an ultrasound machine. And a lot of this information came from Deborah Bowers with her cannulation camp uh, paper in um, 2011. Once the needle is removed, um, mild digital pressure should be applied. Um, and it should, as we said before, it should be held for 10 to 15 minutes. And this is just um, another diagram of uh, uh, how to properly hold. And so if you're teaching patients how to hold, this is best done by holding one side at a time. You cannot have proper um, compression of the two sites if, you're, if the patients are holding both needle sites at the same time. Something that we do not do, or I have, I was never taught, but we should be doing, we should be checking for a brewery and thrill um, before we send the patients home to ensure that that fistula is still working and that we haven't compressed too much. All these um, products that they say help with um, hemostasis are great for the outside hole, but they do not help with the inside hole. So like gel foams, tip stops, sure to seals and sure seals. They're masking a problem um, that could be occurring. Uh, patient education, I uh, have them hold one aside at a time. This way you don't have to have needles close together, better control of hemostasis. And another lesson that I learned where we tried to um, uh, hold both sites with a patient that was very hypotensive. Um, we should have let her recover first. Um, and what happened is she actually thrombosed her fish the, the, the next morning because we had wrapped her up and sent her on her way. Um, and do you have any questions? Thank you so much, Rick, um, for an enlightening presentation. And thanks to all of you who joined uh, from home, work, office, or wherever you are. Uh, we're going to open it up to some questions on the app. So if you want to take a look at... Um, the questions on your app when we can start answering. I've got a couple here that we can ask you and get started, Rick. Um, in your years of experience, what do you think prevents some nurses from being better cannulators? Well, as I said in the presentation, I think um, we have a culture of rushing through the process. And I think nurses really need to take their time um, to assess the access and to really plan where they want to place the needles and not just look at where everyone else has been needling and um, cannulating that way, because basically they're forming the, the, the aneurysms, they're cannulating into the aneurysms and it's really quick. And when it comes to actually having to try to find um, a new place to cannulate, they don't have the experience or the confidence. So their whole rush mentality has actually been a detriment to them. Right, I have to agree with that for sure. Uh, so, and um, what are some of the biggest advancements that you've seen in cannulation over your 35 years? I would have to say the use of the ultrasound. And I know a lot of units don't have an ultrasound, but if you do, you really should utilize it, not just for cannulation, but as I showed in that one diagram where that person's anatomy was so different, we've seen a lot of patients with very strange anatomy where they're at a huge risk of um, uh, of complications. So using the ultrasound has been very beneficial. And it's also shown us that with our rush mentality and with hemostasis, I've seen so many patients that have um, 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 infiltrations right above the actual access, hematomas. They're not visible by the naked eye, but patients will complain and say, it's really tender. They have a hematoma there. And because we've rushed through the process, um, we've developed these hematomas and using the ultrasound has just demonstrated to, to me um, where we've done the patients a disservice. Right, so, um, so sometimes when in some of the units that we have, they don't have ultrasounds. So 
like what else can we do? I mean, I know that we can look, listen and feel and everything, but sometimes if you don't have the ultrasound, what other, like I know, what else, what else can we do when we have um, issues? Yeah, so take your time, um, yeah. you know, have someone to support you. Like, you know, if you haven't, um, uh, if you don't have the confidence to, to candidate someone, at least having some have someone come to support you so they can talk you through it. And sometimes it's just a matter of being talked through um, so that uh, your confidence is increased. So they so the other person can give, give you little tips of what um, you may be doing that will be detrimental. Like, you know, um, if you're not feeling the access correctly, you're not determining what the, um, what the actual depth is. Maybe it's very deep because you can't feel it very well. Maybe you should be using a longer needle. Maybe that short needle is not reaching the access. So there could be a myriad of things of why things aren't working well. But if you have another set of eyes there, they might be able to redirect you um, so that you're more successful. Um, I have another uh, question from Jill to all panelists. It says, for new hemo patients, what would you say are the most important things I guess to teach the patients. So I guess when it comes to their access, what are what, when you're teaching the patients? What are some of the more the more pressing things to make sure that they understand before they're off and running? So when I had new patients uh, and I saw them in clinic even before they started dialysis, I would explain the process of cannulation. Um, if they were going to not do buttonhole cannulation, they weren't going to go home. Um, I told them the proper way that actually they should be cannulated by rope ladder, that they should be creeping up one millimeter at a time and have the nurses do that as well. And then give them the rationale why you want that, because every single patient I talked to did not want aneurysms to be formed. That was yeah. the one thing they didn't want. So if you start teaching them correctly, that if you just creep up a little bit at a time, um, it's not even scary for the, the nurse because you're just going up one millimeter, that's not very much. So eventually you could have 10 centimeters of, um, of length to actually cannulate. And then the other thing I would teach them that I thought was very important, how to hold correctly and not rush through the process. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, one thing I've learned as well and as when you're when for nurses to cannulate is to make sure that they cannulate all the way up the fistula like you were just saying and there's no break so if there's a break then you're going to have aneurysms before and after Absolutely. and if there's no break if you just continue to uh, go all the way up then you're going to avoid that aneurysm and that really has to be like i said a unit policy so everyone's yeah. on board doing the same thing yeah absolutely and then uh from doug he asked, "Are angio needles? Um, angio needle is it? Is it angio needles is better regular needles? What are your ideas between angios and steels? What are your <laughs> preference?" <laughs> no, the loaded that, question. I think. No, this is a very loaded question. It's a very good question. Um, you know, I was always taught with steels, right? But I've um, I've started using angios, and the reason we didn't use angios for the longest time was the cost. But there have been papers out there, there have been some studies showing that angios, if inserted correctly, um, increase the longevity of the access and decrease the interventions that you'll have to do, but they have to be inserted correctly. So it's very important that nurses insert the, um, the Teflons um, correctly. Yeah, I guess um, it is a bit of a, a little bit more, um, you need some more dexterity when you're putting in those angio cats rather than steel. Steels is more getting the tape right, but what are your thoughts? Yeah, anyways, it is, it is a bit more, like you, a little bit more dex, like leaning in. I've seen, I've seen nurses cannulate with Teflons, like they cannulate steels. They insert right to the hilt, then they separate. You could, the damage is already done if you're going to cause damage. So that right. wasn't inserted correctly. You know, they say with Teflons, you insert, you see the flash, you advance a little bit more to ensure that all the perforations, all the holes in the Teflon are actually inserted into the vessel. Then you slip the, the Teflon in and then remove it. And then so the steel will be removed. If you go all the way to the hilt, if you've had a problem, you've created, if you've gone through the back wall, the posterior wall, 
then it's just like inserting a steel needle. Right. Um, so I, I don't have any other questions. Do, do you have anything else that you like? I do have, so I feel like I still have so much to ask you with all of your years. Uh, I was um, the biggest thing and I was part of it. I understand the whole rush mentality. You know, everyone's handy dart, handy dart, handy dart. <laughs> we have to get them out as fast as possible because the next group's coming in. I totally get that, but we're doing the patients a great in, um, disservice by doing that. And I know the patients are part of it. They, they want to get home. I don't blame them, but um, you know, to do things correctly, to hold correctly at the end um, uh, is very, very important. And like, you know, we don't think about it as much as when I was taught, like this is their lifeline. They may only have one access, um, like one fish line. Eventually they're gonna burn all their bridges. So it's our job to keep that access going as long as possible. Yeah, and I think even uh, the education that we can provide our nurses on cannulation and the same education that we provide our patients. And if everybody is provided the same education, uh, I guess education is a huge part of it too for our nurses. Mm -hmm. I just had a, a, there might be, I don't know if you've seen the question, Deidre. Oh, that. here we go. Yep. How much more difficult are endovascular, oh, endovascular fistula, that's awesome. Um, yeah, we might be seeing them coming out. I think that one's from Interior Health. So any tips on cannulating endovascular fistulas? Yeah. Thank you for that. So yeah, I saw that from Danielle too. Hi, Danielle. Um, good question. Um, the endovascular fissures are created differently. Their flow pattern is different. And the amount of flow in the accesses is different. So if you take those things into consideration, they feel different. They feel softer than a normal fistula. Um, the biggest thing that I saw was that with the endovasculars when they first came into the unit, because they feel different, the nurses were anxious. It doesn't feel the same as a surgical fistula. And yes, it doesn't feel the same, but it can be cannulated exactly the same way. Um, I also found that brand new nurses that just finished their courses and they came up to an endovascular fistula really had no problems because they had nothing to compare to. Right. So it was basically older nurses going, this doesn't feel like a, a fish lab. They sort of psych themselves out. That's what I found. Over time, um, they were easier to cannulate because I think the nurse's mindset um, changed. Now, in saying that, some of the places where you may cannulate may be totally different than what you're used to, because if you're trying to cannulate the basilic vein that hasn't been transposed, that's different and that to me, for nurses, that freaks them out as well because that's not the usual. If you have um, ultrasound tools, fantastic, use them and, and to look, but if you don't, you can still fill up um, by palpation. And I had a patient that had an endovascular fistula. It was a basilic, it wasn't transposed and he self cannulated at home without a wow. risk. So if he can do it, you're supposed to be trained just as well. So you should be able to do it too. Sometimes I think it's the mindset that you have to get over. Do you get the aneurysms like you do in a regular fistula or you just, there's just the flow is, how much flow goes through a fistula like oh, it that? Depends. And, uh, every, everything has changed, right? But the flow is a lot less. Um, so typically say an upper arm fistula, you may have 2000 mils per minute. You may only have 700 um, going through the cephalic vein. Maybe 700 is going through the basilic vein as well, right? Because the flow is, um, bifurcated. Uh, aneurysm formation, I didn't see, like I'm thinking of one patient that has had an endovascular fistula for almost seven years. She has no aneurysms mm -hmm. um, because the flow isn't as great. So I don't think you have that pressure on the wall that's creating the, the aneurysms um, as fast. So um, I didn't see that. The other thing I really liked about um, endovascular fistulas, and this is just from my perspective, there's no literature yet. I wasn't seeing central veins, um, brachiocephalic arch stenosis, which happens in about 34% of our patients. They get the stenosis right around the clavicle. Yeah, I wasn't seeing that. And I think it's because we haven't changed the flow pattern. It's there, we haven't changed the anatomy. 
we've just increased some flow in, into some other veins. Well, I'm kind of hoping that's the way that we all go and, you know, for the people that can do that, you know, I think it's a, you have, they're, you have to, they're selected who can, who can uh, have an endovascular fistula, isn't that right? Yeah. It is selective, like, you know, yeah. it's just one more fistula, possible fistula a person can have. So right. you have to have the correct anatomy. So it's, and if it doesn't work, you can always do the traditional ones after that. So we haven't burned any bridges. So it gives a patient one more lifeline that they possibly may not have had. So if they've had a fistula in the past, can you go back into that same arm and do an endovascular fistula? If they've had a radiocephalic, um, a lower arm fistula, absolutely. Um, that would be the next step. I haven't seen anyone who's had um, a brachiocephalic or a brachiobacillic go back and have... Um, um, endovascular. endovascular created but who knows like you know it's so early things things may change in the future i have no yeah. idea yeah yeah i think because the flow isn't so high and you're not going to get the um the pressure in there it might be a bit more difficult would you use the supercast or the the plastic cannulas or does it really matter it depends where you're cannulating if we've used um just regular steel needles um but if it's at a point of flexion we tend to use um you know the supercast Oh, awesome. So if anybody else has any more, any more questions for Rick, uh, you can just type, type it into the chat box and I can ask him. Um, so maybe we'll give it another minute or so and see if anybody has any more questions. But thank you, Rick, so much. Uh, You're welcome. It's, it's my pleasure. And thank yeah. you and um, uh, uh, the BC um, Renal for um, inviting me today to, uh, to talk. Yeah, it's been really great. Thank you very much. So um, thank you for this enlightening presentation. And thanks to all that you have who have joined us. Um, so lunch is up next and the cooking demonstration will begin at 1135 via the live web link at the top of the schedule in the event app. So I guess we're all going to learn a little renal cooking. <laughs> So thank you again, Rick, so much for your time and for putting this presentation together. We've all learned a lot. So thanks again. Thank you and everyone stay safe.